In our coast on the day today, the Admiral, former Berkeley County Commission President, Bill Stubblefield. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here on this brisk, brisk day. Going to get cold tomorrow, so get out and get those leaves today. Yeah, and, uh, you, you know, I think actually tomorrow's a good day. I think tomorrow we're in is the it? 70s. Friday is when oh, it gets, okay. uh, cold front comes in. We drop into the low 50s, high 40s. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, I, I'm, I speak stubble <laughs> I'm fluent at it. I can interpret it as we go along. You, you and my wife are the only two that I have confidence in being able to communicate with. Yeah, I'm like the closed <laughs> captioning on a movie you can't understand with you. <laughs> I'm going to use a couple of words later in the program. But you'll, I'll need your help. Oh, I'm here. I'm, I've been loosening up all morning long. Quite limber at the moment. Uh, our first guest of the day is uh, West Virginia Education Association President Dale Lee. And along with Dale Lee, Lisa Henry as well has been doing some work with the WVA. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And I'm a little disappointed. I thought I was supposed to be the comic relief here. And now. <laughs> oh, no. I got the admiral. <laughs> Apparently, I'm, I'm second fiddle now. Yeah, you might even be third fiddle because he takes up about two. Oh, well, yeah. I, that's the story of my life. I'm yeah. used to that. I have three brothers. so. Oh, yeah. But, Dale, don't hesitate to jump in if he dumps on me too much. I need okay. help. Okay. All right. I'll do that. Lisa, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Awesome. How about yourself? Doing well, thank you. We usually bring you in to talk about the backpack program, but you also do work with the WVEA. Yes, that's my paying job. I am the uh, regional rep out here in the Eastern Panhandle, and we, I cover nine counties. So um, I'm very happy that uh, Dale is out here in the Eastern Panhandle. He makes it out here several times a year, so mm -hmm. glad we could bring him on the show today. Yeah, a couple times we've had the benefit of Dale being in studio with us too. So, Dale? Yeah, it's, it's great. I uh, always love to come in and be over in the eastern panhandle it's uh it's great to see the different parts of the state and everybody has their their problems their their differences but uh, you all have a unique set over here in the eastern panhandles just like everyone else does the southern part everything else and it's good for me to come out and listen to our educators and really find out what's going on your problem here is growth unlike most of the rest of the state sure. where their problem is uh, people are leaving yeah, it's a completely the opposite way here. With with growth, uh, with growth comes uh, inflation. Uh, sure, uh, housing prices are higher and and such. Which uh, I, if we I was going to go PEIA first, but let's uh, first start instead with the the cost of living here in the Eastern Panhandle being higher. People have pushed for a potential higher pay in the Eastern Panhandle for teachers, uh, staff, employees, and such. Uh, I would be shocked if I did a, a interview with you that I wasn't asked about locality pay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and again, it's it's not that we're against locality pay. We believe that the way to do it and, and that has the opportunity to get passed is to reduce the local shares. And that or, means what? It means that uh, the, the county gets to keep more of the local tax dollars. Uh, right now, it used to be at 98%. It dropped down to 90%. If you drop that down to 80%, and so the county gets to keep more of their tax dollars, and you designate that to be used for salaries and benefits, and that's the key to that. If you just use it and say, here's your more tax dollars, do what you want, then you're going to see building projects and roofs and things like that. But if you designate it for salaries and benefits, then you can have the raises that the people need or give it in housing allowances and things like that. And it has a great opportunity to pass because then it benefits all 55 counties, not just four or five counties. Uh, and, and Jason Barrett has tried to get locality pay for state police, and it just doesn't pass because five counties will vote for it and 50 counties vote against it. Uh, but reducing the local shares, letting you keep more of your tax dollars – that has the opportunity to pass, and that's the one that makes the sense. Is that a simple vote of the legislature? Yes, it is. Yeah. Is, is this an extension or be incorporated in the home rule that we've been advocating for so long? It, it would be. Okay, so it would be part be. of the home rule. So, yeah. 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 Does it have to be part of home rule? It doesn't have to be, but, but when we reduced it from 98% to 90%, uh, Berkeley and Jefferson were two of the counties – that actually used it for what it was intended to be. And that's when they increased some salaries here and gave housing allowances and, and things like that. So they used it for the purpose. Now multiply that even more and you, you can see you can then be competitive with the uh, surrounding states. 
Dale, I want to ask you about PEIA. There's been a couple of articles in regards to the premium increases, 24% last year, expected to be 10% uh, this upcoming year. And at this time, there is no corresponding commitment to a raise. It could happen, but at this time, there's no corresponding right. commitment to it. Uh, what, you're, what are you hearing from the teachers as another health insurance increase kicks in? Well, one of the things that bothered me last night at the public hearing here in Martinsburg is that there was only one delegate uh, at, at the public hearing. You would think that delegates and senators would want to come out and listen to their constituents. Uh, delegate Kump was the only one there. Larry Kump. Uh, and he, he's been there at every one that I've been to over here. I mean, he's, he's always there. But people can't absorb that continued high cost. They like to say, well, on the private sector, this is happening all over the place. Well, I don't know any private sector insurance plan that has seen a 35% increase in two years. Now, you see it. We have a private plan uh, at WVA for our employees, and we see premium increases, but certainly not 35% premium increases. And if you look at the five-year projection for PEIA, the next three years will continue to be 10% or more. So you would be looking at a 65% to 65 to 69% premium increase in five years. How can people do that? How can you? How can anybody absorb that cost? And that's why the legislature needs to change this 80-20 rule that they have. And it's a hard, fast 80-20 rule. So it doesn't matter how much money. Uh, explain that, that real quick. 80, that, yeah. that when the state puts in money, 80% uh, is the state money and the employees have to put up 20% to match that. So uh, this year the, the state put in an additional, I think it was like $65 million. And that's the reason you saw the 10% increase in the employee's premium because you have to keep it at an 80-20 match. And, and so the premiums for employees went up $15 million or 10.5%. And now, if what we, we advocated in, in 2018, that if you would say the state shall put no less than 80 percent and the employees should put no more than 20 percent into the plan and any cost savings to the plan. And there's always cost savings. And, and I contended last night that those are the, uh, the, the employees who provide those cost savings because utilization, things like that. That should be credited toward the employees 20 percent of, of the premium. And this increase is coupled with the fact you're telling me off air that we, the teacher's salary, we've now slipped down to 50th mm -hmm. of the 50 states. So we're the poorest paying state in the nation as far as teacher salaries, correct? We, yeah. We, when we didn't get a raise, uh, it, it's always a year behind. So two years ago when there wasn't a pay raise, it dropped us to 50th in the nation. Now I anticipate with the raise that people saw this year, which really wasn't a raise. It was a cost shift. It was a way of paying for that 24.2% premium increase. Uh, you will, will move up probably to 48th, 47th, 40, somewhere around there. Yeah. That was a one year stipend though, correct? Right. Well, it, but it's base building. It, it is one, base building. It, it, it was one I, year. I've been but told it is, otherwise. It was base building. Okay, so that, that I think it was twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars. Twenty three hundred dollars. That's built in, and that won't ever go away. No, no. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I've interviewed several legislators, including the man who owns this place right here, Mike Hornby, who's a mm -hmm. delegate, uh, about PEIA increases in premiums, and without exception response that comes back from every legislator I've interviewed is, well, yeah, but for years they never had an increase in premiums while everybody else was. So they might have gotten 24%, but for the eight or nine or 10 years before that, their increases were close to 0%. Well, and, and that's not totally accurate either. Uh, Premium-wise, that may be accurate, but what was happening is for those 10-year period, the state wasn't putting any additional dollars into PEIA. So what you saw is, is benefit reductions. You saw uh, out-of-pocket costs increase. You saw uh, deductibles increase. You saw uh, incentives increase. We used to have an incentive that if you had a living will or those types of things, that it would be a premium reduction for you. Uh, those had to be taken away when the state wasn't putting any money in to balance PEIA. So while it, it may be true that, uh, well, they haven't had an increase in 10 years, remember three of those years, 
is when Governor Justice put additional money in and he moved the tiers to prevent anybody from having premium increases. Uh, I would have rather, had, during those three-year periods, had small increases in premiums instead of one large 24% premium increase. I've said over and over, we know we have to have some skin in the game. There's no denying that. The employees have to have some skin in the game. But you can't skin us like uh, you, you would uh, a deer or something like that. We're using all of our skin in, into this when you're looking at 65%. The, the other response I'm getting on the 80-20 split is if the state didn't start to enforce the 80-20 split, PEIA would go bankrupt, and there wouldn't just be PEIA with higher health insurance premiums. There would just be no health insurance. Uh, and, and, and I don't concur with that argument. I was around in 1990 when PEIA was broke. I was a third-year teacher, and that was the first teacher strike in, in 1990. Doctors wouldn't take your insurance. You were having to pay up front to go to a doctor or to go to a hospital or anything like that because PEIA was broke. We sustained that, we built it back up, and sustained it there. I don't believe that it will go broke. Now, no one ever anticipated the, the huge increase in health care costs, particularly prescription drugs. I mean, that's, that's the, the big outlier. Uh, can, can you spend 20 minutes watching TV that you don't see some drug commercial come out? Well, that's got to be paid for somehow, and... That's the prescription drug cost in in United States is just unbelievable. It's it's way out of of uh, market for what everything should be. So well, you have those costs, but but we wouldn't go broke. Yeah, the uh, uh, go, uh, Senator Manchin has tried to put cap on certain prescription drug costs. Uh, hopefully, this escalation uh, will slow down somewhat, but. I, I, but, I but hope it, it affects will too. The teachers affects everybody. These uh, drugs. Yeah. Uh, Lee, uh, uh, PIA is a uh, is something we spend a lot of time looking at. Uh, but there's other issues as well. Uh, you, the your education association, last year, year and a half or so ago, spent a lot of time traveling the state, mm -hmm. uh, getting input from teachers, from family, from parents, from from everybody. Uh, there's quite a fanfare, but after you complete it, there's been very little that's been reported out. What did you do with that report? We, we reported out to the State Board of Education and to the House and, and Senate Education Committees mm -hmm. because any change that's made in education has to go through the legislature or, or through the state board. So we presented those findings to them, and it was nothing that uh, shocked anyone. Number one issue was you had to pay teachers more in, to be able to get them to stay in the, in the state. The second month report will come out sometime this week from the State Department. Last year, there were over 1,500 positions without a certified teacher in them. I predict that that will grow to about 1,700 or more this year. And then you look at the bus drivers. You can't get bus runs. You can't uh, get aides. You can't get cooks anymore. Those are... are problems that we have to address when we had the corrections problem uh the legislature took immediate action and said we got to give them a ten thousand dollar raise well we have a crisis in education secondly was you have to address the behavior and mental and emotional state of the students doesn't matter what you want to programs you want to say well we're going to make sure that they're reading at third grade level until we address the the behavior issues and the emotional issues of these children we're fighting a losing battle. Uh, we go back to, I always talk about in the uh, 20 teens, like a 2012, 2013, we had a, a innovation zone project that put alternative settings in elementary schools. Now you'll see alternative behavior settings in middle schools and high schools, but you never see them in, in elementary schools. Well, that's where the problems start. I mean, you have kindergarten kids who are disruptive and, and uh, are showing outbursts. If you have, we put those in the school where you could take the student and work on both their behavior and their academics. And what you saw is a 74% increase, I mean, 74% decrease in behavior issues and an improvement of 72% in the academics. Good gosh, that works. Why did we quit doing it? Because we stopped funding innovation zones and we stopped funding it. 
we have to go back to that. We have to go back to a program where we're addressing these mental and emotional issues for these kids and the behavior issues of these kids. So you submitted the report to the uh, State Board of Education mm-hmm. and the Education Committee in both the Senate and the House side. Have you gotten feedback? Have they invited you to the table to try to address and solve these problems? No, I haven't been invited to the table uh, in, in a long time. Why to, is that? To solve that problem. Well, you, you really want to get me in trouble here, don't you? Well, no. We, we, <laughs> it, 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 it's because uh, we, we are seen in, in many eyes, uh, and, and I will say particularly in, in some of the senators' eyes more so than the House, uh, as, as the people who are just fighting for the status quo or just fighting for for money for for teachers and and service personnel and not really addressing the student issue this is my 16th year as president of wva i take great pride in everything that we do in this association we're never going to apologize for standing up for our members but we always gear it toward our students because our, our students are the reason we came into education to begin with and, and that's the piece that they miss. They don't see us out there fighting. When I talk to them about we need to put these alternative settings in the elementary school, it has nothing to do with paying teachers or paying bus drivers or anything. It's about addressing the issues those kids face. Uh, but but in many of their eyes, we're, we're viewed as the, the enemy, which doesn't make sense to me. Part of the show this morning, I looked at your web page and – to your credit, the very first sentence and the very first paragraph was students, students. Sure. Yeah. So, Our guest is Dale Lee, president of the WVEA, Lisa Henry with the WVEA as well in charge of nine counties. Keeping after them, Lisa, you had a comment a few minutes ago you didn't get a chance to make. Um, I just want to echo what Dale is saying is very true in the Eastern Panhandle um, that with the um, – teacher shortage, um, bus drivers. I wanted, um, Dale did mention service personnel. Um, These premium increases are hurting service personnel even more because they have a lower paycheck. Um, And also anybody who had the spousal surcharge, they are making less than they did last year. And that is just making people look and say, maybe this isn't for me. I want to go to another state. I want to do another career. Um, And it is it's really hurting people. Lisa, let me pick up on that. Uh, we hear that all the time, that the, uh, the teachers, our solution is to get a job somewhere else. But we've been hearing that for years. Uh, does this, do the numbers, statistics show that the number of folks leaving the teaching profession is higher today than it say was mid-90s? So, uh, I can't speak to the 90s, but okay. um, it is um, just in this past year um, – Berkeley County alone has about 250 positions filled by uncertified teachers. There was, um, I think last I looked, 19 buses. Seven were canceled. Um, Twelve were um, had to be picked up by other runs just today. That's happening on a daily basis. Um, and those buses that can't go get kids, the kids who don't have the parents or the network or in the parents who don't have the resources to drive their kids to school, those are the kids who really need to be in school. Those are the ones that need that routine. Um, and it, it's not getting better. It's, it's November now, and it's still happening. And we saw in 2018, there were, uh, when the little activity that sparked the nation happened in West Virginia, there were 728 positions without a certified teacher in them across the state of West Virginia. Last year, that went up to more than 1,500. And again, this year, we'll get the report out sometime this week. It's going to be more than that. So, yes, they they are leaving the profession in droves. Uh, We have probably two or three hours of what we need to talk about that's going to be squeezed in 30 minutes. So excuse me for shotgunning from that's my subject. Right. subject. You also mentioned discipline. Uh, that is a subject that's mentioned quite frequently. But what's the solution? Well, again, you, you have to look at, at what causing those discipline problems. Uh, West Virginia is one of the leaders in the nation in the opioid epidemic. You, we have more parents that uh, are not with their kids. We have more grandparents or relatives who are, adre- who are keeping these kids now. And you see the problems that they face. I can't imagine a six-year-old kid 
being uh, awakened in the middle of the night by the police arresting their mom or something like that for, for these drug issues and things like that. Those, how does that kid concentrate the next day at school and, and those types of things? So that's what we have to address, the, the mental and the emotional state of these students. And that works then on the discipline issue and, and move forward from there. Okay, fine. I accept that as very important. But the leading question, the related question is how? How do we do it? without the, Because what you're proposing is going to uh, cost a lot of money. Well, you know, it's, it's where you make a priority. Yeah. And uh, we, we find money in this state for anything that we want to make a priority of. We wanted to make a priority of getting rid of an income tax, so, so we did that. Uh, you have to make an investment, and that's, that's what we said in 2018. You need to make an investment in, in our students, and you have to make an investment in the students now. It, it will cost some money. But that investment will, will re be rewarded leaps and bounds because when industry wants to come into the state of West Virginia, what's the first thing they ask and look at is the education system. And do we have an educated workforce? So it, it will pay for itself. You just have to make that investment. Following the, the pattern of jumping subject to subject in a short period of time, uh, what about school security? Has there been enough attention given to that? Uh, you know, I, I, I think so. In, in West Virginia, we, we continue to look at, at security and, and ways to, to improve it. Uh, one of the things that, that you never talk about, and, and fortunately you, you don't have to, is, is the number of issues in West Virginia schools that never materialize because somebody has reported it to the proper people, somebody has reported it to uh, the authorities, and it stopped before a tragedy happens. Uh, I, I would love to have those numbers, but for security reasons, you, you, you're not going to get those. You don't want to come out and say there were 1,327 issues last year in West Virginia schools that were stopped. You don't want to, to promote that uh, because you don't want to give kids that thought. But we have issues in, in schools now. I mean, we have uh, uh, a middle school I can think of that uh, two, two students put out a hit list. And that was caught immediately, and, and that's being addressed. So we are stopping these issues uh, well before anything tragic happens. Just got a text from Berkeley County Sheriff Nate Harmon who said the Handle with Care program that all of us law enforcement agencies participate in with the Schools for kids that are exposed to traumatic events, which allows the teachers to be notified and allows the teachers to create a different conducive learning atmosphere for the child. Is that adopted in all 55 counties, Dale? I, I, I believe it is, and that is a great, the sheriff is right, that is a great, great, great program because we don't know what's happening to these kids at night. And, and when we're notified and when you know that as, as the teacher or the bus driver or the cook or the aide, then it, it gives you a different perspective on that child, and, and, and it makes things uh, different for them that, that you can go in and address that differently. So the sheriff's right. That is an absolutely great program. I have a question for you in regards to pay raises, Dale, and I know you, you probably know as much as I do about whether or not there will be a, a January bill that addresses that. But in regards to those, the complaints I've heard about those is it's a 5% general overall pay raise, but the people that are – more at the top of the pay scale, don't see anywhere close to a 5% pay raise, and, and that's bothering them, and it should. It, it should, but uh, one of the problems we have with attracting people into the profession is the low starting salary. And the only way to address that low starting salary and get people into the profession is to make it an across-the-board raise instead of a percentage raise. Uh, and And while... It, it does hurt the veteran teachers. Think about it in this perspective. If you put it a percentage raise, we gripe about how much administrators get paid all the time in, in, in many of the circles. But the administrators would have a much larger raise because they're making more money uh, as it is. So, so it's, it's you know, trying to attract people in the profession. It is a difficult line to, to balance, uh, but... But is it not more expensive to replace a teacher with 10 or 12 years of experience than it is to recruit a new one? It's, it's more expensive in terms of salary uh, and, and 
research has shown that that after a teacher hits about the tenth year is when they're really starting to to master their craft. Uh, and, and you that's who you're losing that because well they get the smaller pay raise. Actually that that's that's not a, as much of an issue. If if you have ten to fifteen years in the state, generally you're vested in the state and you're gonna stick around. It's uh, we lose more than fifty percent of the stu- of the teachers within the first five years. They're the ones who are leaving the profession at a far greater rate. Well, now, I, I was thinking more about around here those who it, jump the border. It, well, uh, and, and that that may be here, but but statewide, it's it's the the younger people who are, are leaving quicker. Dave, well, we are out of time. Um, I, Bill would go another half hour if I, I let him. I, I, would, know, I, I know he I would. A dozen questions. Like this has been very good. Well, let, let me give you one more basketball story, and this Certainly. will put this all in perspective about you know what what happens. First year, I'm a basketball coach. I'm an assistant coach at Bramwell High School, a single A school in Mercer County. We have a great, great basketball team. I'm the JV coach, and didn't know what I was doing, but I had a great team. Midway through the season, we're 11 and 1. And I'm starting to think, man, I, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> you know, and I tell the head coach, who's a great friend of mine, he's passed away, unfortunately. I said, you know, Robert, I got the hang of this. We're, we're 11 and 1. And he looked at me and said, well, you do know you're the losingest coach at the school. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all perspective. <laughs> that, one, that one loss can be unforgiving. Uh, and that was true. We, we were 26 and 0 going into the championship game as a varsity and lost the championship game. Dale, good to see you again. Good to see you, and thank you all for having me. Lisa, thanks for setting this up. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa Henry at 833 and Dale Lee from the WVEA in a segment brought to you.